Hi everybody, and I greet you in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. I know we've got folk here from right around the world, and of course from South Africa, so it's a real pleasure to be walking with you in the footsteps of Jesus through the book of Hebrews. So I'm looking forward to this journey with you. But first let me answer a question. Why this study? Why are we doing a Bible study? Why on the book of Hebrews? Well, first of all, many people over the last few months particularly have requested that we do some kind of Bible study. There seems to be a hunger and a, maybe a dryness for the Word of God out there. Why the book of Hebrews? Well, the book of Hebrews is fascinating. It's not what you may think it is. It's not just a collection of Old Testament texts and weird Old Testament customs. It's actually fascinating. And it's all about Jesus. It forms a bridge, you know. In an age where the Old Testament is totally neglected by some and overemphasized by others, you know, in a sort of legalistic way, the book of Hebrews forms a bridge between Old Testament and New. It brings the old into the new and helps us to understand many of the things that are said to us and taught us, especially by Jesus, within the context of the Old Testament traditions and scriptures. Thirdly, it has some very vital warnings for us and exhortations, because, you know, whenever the Lord Jesus gives a warning, he also gives an exhortation and an encouragement. But these exhortations, and particularly the warnings, apply to us today. So in that sense, the book of Hebrews is right up to date and applicable to us. But most especially, the book of Hebrews is Jesus-centered. And he actually is at the center of the entire book. That's why I'd like to do study in Hebrews. That's why I think it'll be useful for you. And that's why I think it'll be helpful for us within our nations and particularly, I think, my own nation at this time. Okay, before going uh, diving in, or use the metaphor, taking the first step in the sand, let me just give you some details of logistics. You know, I consider doing live streaming, but frankly, we've got folk from New Zealand through to the USA on the one side, Switzerland in the middle, and the UK, and South Africa now in South, and all over the place. And so what time zone would I pick? When is it convenient for some? In the middle of the night for others? So live stream really wasn't a great idea. Also, I think um, this might attract an awful lot of people. And if it does, interactive live streaming becomes really hard to manage and a little bit chaotic, actually. So I opted for a different option. I decided to do pre-recordings, but I'm keeping them up to date. So I'm not doing them months and months and months in advance. Pre-recordings of each lesson, which I will then put up on YouTube. And the benefit of that is that people can access that at any time. You know, they won't disappear. They'll stay on YouTube on my Truth is the Word channel. Actually, it's my personal channel that features Truth is the Word. And it'll stay there. And whoever wants to watch and listen at any time, on any day, once the video is live, they can access it. So it has that tremendous advantage. I'm aiming for 30 to 49 minutes maximum. Don't intend really going over 30 minutes too often, but I certainly won't go beyond three quarters of an hour-ish. 30 minutes, though, is the aim. I'm also going to notify folk every week on Mondays or Tuesdays. I'm going to post it through social media and put up the link. So it's just so simple for anybody who wants to find the link. They get the notification. They click on it. And boom, it takes them straight back, straight through to the YouTube channel. So that's the idea. Okay, firstly, I want to take you into the structure of the book of Hebrews, because it's quite revealing and, and helpful. And I'll probably refer back to the Hebrew structure from time to time during the series. But before I show you the structure and walk you through it, let me just ask the question, who wrote the book? And when was it written? <laughs> Why does that matter? Well, some say Paul wrote the book, but unfortunately, the author doesn't declare who he is. He doesn't say, you know, Paul, your, your brother or disciple of the Lord Jesus or anything like that. It, it's not personalized in that way. So most folk recognize the hand of Paul in this. Others say it's probably Barnabas or maybe even Apollos because they were well-schooled in 
Hebrew law and custom and so on. But I think it's Paul. And one of the reasons I think it's Paul is because the structure kind of shows his typical way of structuring these books, as we'll see in just a moment. Well, you know, when was it written? Well, about 63 AD. That's just 33 years after Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and then rose from the dead. Why is that significant? Well, it's fresh. It's right during the period when all the disciples were still alive, well, most of them. You know, the 11 were still functioning and they were traveling around and most of them were still alive at that stage, certainly some of the key players. And so there's a certain authenticity that it was something that was up for them, everybody to see and to be circulated around and for them to read, etc. So that gives it a, a certain authenticity. It gives us also a fresh insight into the people and the church particularly of those very early days of Christianity. So now let me just put up the actual structure and then I'll talk you through it. Okay, there is how the book of Hebrews is structured. It has an introduction, verses 1 to 3, and then right at the end, it has a conclusion. So those are the two slices of wholesome, gluten-free, whole wheat bread that make the sandwich, and in the middle is a rich filling. And the filling is in two parts. There's the theological basis for Christ's superiority. That's the doctrinal section. And then there is the second section, which is the practical outworking of Christ's superiority. That's the praxis, the, the practical side of things. Now, that's typical Paul. First, the theory, first, the ideas, first, the grand concepts, first, the doctrines. And then, OK, here's how we apply them. This is what it means to us today. So that's very helpful for us, I think. In the doctrinal portion, you have Jesus, our superior prophet, Jesus, our superior king, our superior priest, and then Jesus' ministry, superior to the Old Testament ministry, the Old Covenant ministry. In the Old Testament times, the prophet, priest, and king were the three key figures, and of course, the Old Covenant was the basis upon which they prophesied, and the basis upon which they ruled, and the basis upon which they ministered. So Paul is coming and saying, yeah, you know the great prophets. You know the prophets of old, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Nehemiah. They were all great and wonderful men of God. But Jesus is greater. Jesus is the prophet. Yes, I know you all honor and revere the memory of King David and King Solomon and many of the wonderful kings that came after them. But Jesus is superior to them all. Jesus is the great king. And yes, temple worship, and before that, tabernacle worship, has always been important to us in Israel, in, in the Jewish faith. And you know of Aaron, and you know of all the priests that came after him. Now Jesus, he's greater. He is the great high priest. And of course, folk, we all know, I know, writes Paul, that you base your life and in your childhood you came through living to the covenants and the laws and the customs and the festivals and the sacrifices of Israel. But now there's a better covenant. There's a better sanctuary. And there's a better sacrifice in Jesus. Then the second part is the practical outworking. And, and here there are a number of exhortations. In the first part, you find the five warnings, and I'll be taking you through those carefully. In the second part, they are counterbalanced against those, the five exhortations. It's an exhortation to enter this new sanctuary in and through Christ Jesus, to endure persecution, to have faith and maintain your faith. To accept discipline from the Lord's hand, for it is good and builds us up. And then the exhortation to Christian living, live like Jesus in the world 
in which we find ourselves, in which we are sojourned like strangers and aliens. Okay, so that's the basic structure. Now, who was the letter originally addressed to? Well, the first readers were Jewish folk who had become disciples of the Lord Jesus. So they were steeped in Judaism. They had been brought up in Judaism. But they understood that Jesus was the way and the truth and the life. And they had come to follow him and to love him and to be obedient to him. And this is very important to our understanding of the book, to understand who these people were. Then we can relate to them. We can also understand something about their condition and why they thought as they did and, and why Paul is writing such stern warnings to them and how those maybe relate to us in our day. There's a lot of Old Testament references, lots and lots and lots. But don't be fooled, because the book is actually all about Jesus. He's the center of it. He's the superior prophet, the superior king, and the superior priest, and his covenant of love is greater than all. Jesus is the best. And that really is the central issue for the book of Hebrews. That's where the focus is. And that's where our focus should be. All right. Um, one other thing that I want to draw your attention to is the very first verses of the book of Hebrews. Because they give us a key to where this is going and what it's all about. So, again, have a look at this. Here in this chart, I've put a little graphic representation of the contents of Hebrews 1, verse 3. It says there, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. This is such, such an important statement. It is such a central statement to our faith and our living. Jesus is the exact representation of the being of the triune Godhead. We want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Do you want to know what God says? Listen to Jesus. Do you want to know what God does? Follow Jesus and see what he did. He is central because he is the incarnation of the triune deity. He is the exact representation of his being. And then it contains that little word, which is a unique word found only here in all the writings of the New Testament. The word is translated as radiance. A gosmuya. I think you've, you can see it right there. And it, it has a strange meaning. Apogosmuya. Or flesh. A beam of bright light emanating from a radiant light. Now, the only way I can try and describe that is if um, if you were looking at a picture of the sun, you know, the sun is the source of great uh, physical radiance in, in our world. If you have a picture of the sun, you often see these uh, eruptions, solar eruptions, where there's a sort of an, a, a, an off flash from the sun that erupts and moves out at great speed. Well, it's saying something like this. The Godhead is the source of radiant light. And Jesus in his person, in his personality, in everything about him, is this out ray of bright light that's come from that, which shows us the nature of the light, which illuminates our lives with light, which shows, shows light onto our paths. He is the light which brings light into the world. He is the light by which we live. That's why he is the way. That's why he's the truth. And that's why he's the life, because he is the very source of that radiance in our three-dimensional human dimension. 
In our world, Jesus is the outray, the off flesh, of the very light of the Godhead. And there's a great relevance to us today in this. You know, um, these warnings and exhortations that we have in the book of Revelation, in the book of Hebrews, is all just to remind us about the centrality of Jesus and to stay focused on that. We're living in a world of great chaos right now, aren't we? Chaos rules. The value system is topsy-turvy. It's upside down. People call right wrong and wrong right. And everybody has what they call truth, but it's actually lies. And you don't know which is lies and you don't know what is truth. We're living in an age of tremendous disinformation. We've got to do a fact check on absolutely everything we get. And you know what? You do a fact check. And then the purveyors of that misinformation tell you, no, those fact checkers are wrong. They the misinformants. It's terribly confusing. But that is what we like in our world. Chaos, disinformation, and inverted values. And so we have to keep focused, 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 focused on the Lord Jesus Christ at all times. I want to give you a little uh, teaser for the second lesson. The second lesson is going to be from the very introduction to the book of Hebrews, that's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And it's about, of course, my favorite subject. Now, if you haven't gathered my favorite subject by now, after just these few minutes in this video, and those who know me well would know what the favorite subject is, it's the centrality of Jesus. And here you have it right in the first three verses. And I want to make this statement. The centrality of Jesus is probably the most important message that God is sending to the world and to us at this time, right now. In this world of chaos, in this world of inverted values, in this world of disinformation, Jesus is the only rock. He is the anchor. He is the central pillar. He is the foundation. He is the capstone. What he said and what he did must be the foundation of truth. We want to know what is the source of truth. Well, we don't have to go to Snopes. We've got to go to the scripture to see what Jesus said, for he is the source of truth. That's why I wrote that whole book, Truth is the Word, just to make this point in hundreds of pages that Jesus is the source of truth. Now, we don't wear a what would Jesus do, what would Jesus say thing on our wrists anymore like the people in the Jesus movement of old, the hippies. No, uh, instead, we wear it in our hearts and our minds. But what would Jesus do and what did Jesus do? What would Jesus say? What did Jesus say? Echoes when we confront anything. When we confront a business a friendship, a difficulty, a trouble, a temptation. The issue is, how do I handle this from a Jesus perspective? How should I see this from a Jesus perspective? If I look at the world through Jesus-tinted spectacles, how do I see it? What is the truth here? What is the way in which to walk? Now, a lot of folks say, well, you just go to the Bible, you know, just uh, read your Bible, Chris. Yep, of course, the Bible is the inscripturated word of God, undoubtedly. But its purpose is to reveal Jesus to us. He, not some printed pages, is the giver of life. He is the author who wrote the words on the printed pages. We don't revere a book, we don't venerate a book, we don't bow down before a book. I was in a church once many, many, many years ago, and I was first time I was exposed to it was one of the traditional denominations. They started the service by marching in solemn procession in from the side, carrying an old leather-covered Bible on a cushion, a velvet cushion. And then they opened it and they placed it in the front. What? Of course the Bible is important, but it's not God. 
it reveals God to us. In the pages of scripture, we find Jesus. Jesus is God in human form, and he appeared to mankind and said, You want to know what God's like? Here I am. Remember, his disciples said, if you just show us the Father, you know, Yahweh, show us God. And Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen God. Oh my. He walked with them for three and a half years. He held their hands. He fed them fish and bread. They watched him do the most outstanding, miraculous things and they had not yet realized that they were looking upon the face of God. I just love that uh, Christmas song, Mary, Did You Know? Do you know it? And one of the lines says, Mary, did you know that the the, the babe that you hold, and when you look at him, you, you see the face of God. And as he grew up, we still see the face of God. And you know, here's the wonder of it. The Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and our minds and regenerates our spirits so that we can behold him still today. We still see the face of God in Jesus. We can still know him. Remember what he said to his disciples? More blessed are those who believe, although they haven't seen me. Yet they love me and they believe me. Well, through the wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit, we can know God in Christ Jesus. We can know how to live by him. When we look at scripture, we need to understand it through the lens of what Jesus said, what Jesus did, what Jesus reveals to us of the nature and the character and the purposes of the Godhead. This, if there is a golden key to unlocking scripture, this is it, guys. So much confusion, and I'll be dealing with this in our next lesson in, in, in far, far more depth. But there's so much confusion as to what does the Bible mean, and people take verses out of context and they do all those strange things. Most of that would be eliminated if we would just look at the scriptures, particularly the difficult portions, through the eyes of Jesus. Put on Jesus-tinted spectacles. And look at the scriptures and say, ah, oh, now I can understand what that means. Look at Look at it through the reference point of Jesus, and particularly through things he'd said and did in this life. Okay, before I wind up for today, our first session, I want to just give you some notifications of the way ahead. So have a look here. Here are the ways that you will be able to get hold of this weekly video. First of all, it'll be on my Facebook page. You just have to search for me, Christopher Pepler, or Dr. Dr. Christopher Pepler. But more particularly, my Facebook tag address is actually Christopher.Pepler. So just type that into Facebook and you'll, you'll pick me up straight away. Every week, and I post on, on my Facebook page weekly anyway about the posts and the podcasts that I do and any other announcements, There'll be a special announcement every single week. It'll either be on Monday or early on Tuesday saying, right, uh, here is something about maybe the last lesson. Maybe here's a link to the diagram. Maybe I'll put a link to this structure document that I've got here so you can read that from time to time. And here's the link to the next lesson. So then from Tuesday, sometime during the day, Tuesday, sometime during the day, South African time, Tuesday, It'll go live on YouTube. I'll upload it and make it live straight away. And if you click on the link then, it'll take you straight through to that video on YouTube. I'm also going to post it on my Truth is the Word website. So um, there is where I post all the stuff I do, the books, the articles I write, and the weekly posts. And you'll find that under truthistheword.com. You see, there it is on in front of you, truthistheword.com. There again, the post will give you the link to the YouTube video. Now, if you want to subscribe to receive an email notification so that you don't even have to look up Truth is the Word from there on in, you can just receive an automatically system-generated email telling you about it, then just under the banner at the top of that website, right-hand side, just under the banner, you'll see a long yellow button, beige yellow button, which says, 
get truth is the word by mail. Click that. It'll ask you to fill in your name and email address, nothing more. And from there on in, you will start getting everything I post on Truth is the Word. The articles, the podcast notifications, and in this context, you will be getting a weekly notification as well by email. The um, other thing that I'm going to be using the Truth is the Word website for is that if you want to make a comment or want to ask a question, that's quite difficult because the videos are not live. They don't have sort of a, a text response button at the bottom. But what you can do, you can go to any one of those posts on Truth is the Word. Any one of the posts that notifies you about the Bible study and the upcoming lesson. And at the bottom of that, you'll see there's a little form which says, you know, leave a comment. And you put your name and email address in the box and you just type in the comment. And the comment could be, you know, I didn't understand this or I didn't find that relevant or please can we have more of such and such or what about this or that. It can be anything of that nature. So you can put questions as well Is you know, have you considered this or could you please give us the Old Testament reference that you were talking about in this last lesson. Feel free to do that. And I'll, as, as long as I can, as long as the volumes don't get too great, I will really try and come back to you quickly on that. The site will notify me straight away when there is somebody who's left a comment. I'll pick it up and I'll comment on that same page. So you'll be able to find it, you'll be notified that it's been answered, and you'll be able to pick it up from there. Then the last way I've been notified is through a WhatsApp group that I've set up. Now, a lot of people use WhatsApp, and I know many of the elderly folk will, won't particularly use Facebook or any of that thing, but they've all got cell phones and they all use WhatsApp. So I've created a WhatsApp group, and again, on that WhatsApp group, every week, I'll put the same notification and the same link. So that even if you're looking at it on your cell phone, you could then click that link and it will take you straight through to the lesson on YouTube. All I need from you is for you to please send me your number and your name. And you can send that through on my cell phone, 0825512530. And then I'll enroll you onto that group. And from there on in, it'll appear automatically as part of your WhatsApp feed. Okay, so those are the notifications for that. Today has been a, a much shorter day than usual. And, but I'm just coming up to, you know, the 30-minute-ish mark. And so I want to sign off at this point and just say that I'm looking forward to going through this series with you. I'm looking forward to taking step upon step with you on the wonderful fertile sand of the book of Hebrews walking towards the horizon, that horizon of faith and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. So God be with you until then, and please won't you allow me just right now to, to pray for us as a group. Father, in Jesus' wonderful name I ask you, please won't you bless these things because they're for you and they're about you. Holy Spirit, won't you anoint this Bible study, anoint me and anoint the ears of those who hear and the eyes of those who see. Because if your anointing does not rest upon this, then it's just word upon word, line upon line. It's just data and information. There's already so much data, so much information in this world. We, we want far more than that, Lord. We want a sense of your presence, even as we're going through a web-based series like this. We want to know your presence in it and know your approval. So this I do ask, and I do ask it in the wonderful and the authoritative and the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Until next time, see you then. God be with you.